I think that the concept of art should be embraced as this materialization of an idea that resonates with the individual who receives it. Hello and welcome to episode 100 of the Lewis and Kyle show. Thank you for listening. Pretty cool that we're at episode 100. We'll put out an episode in the next couple of weeks. Just Kyle and I talking about, you know, lessons from doing 100 podcasts, those types of things. But in the meantime, this episode, not about us. It's about our guest, Maria Brito. She is an art advisor. She's been with celebrity clients like Gwyneth Paltrow, Puff Daddy, and many, many more. She's worked with artists like Banksy and Ai Weiwei and many, many more. Before that, she was a lawyer who did her training at Harvard, which is cool. And originally, she was from Venezuela and only moved to the U.S. to go to Harvard and then stayed and then New York City and art and all that. And she kind of tells that story. Her art advisory is a very interesting practice. She kind of introduces what she does, how she does it in this interview. Uh, mainly, we're here to discuss her new book, How Creativity Rules the World, the Art and Business of Turning Your Ideas into Gold. I have a copy of it right here for those of you on camera. I got it after the interview, not beforehand, because this was before the book was even published. But if you're listening today, the book is published. And you can buy it on Amazon, buy it in any major, really, she, do it, she, do it, she did it right. Every, everywhere, anywhere, you can buy a book, you can get this book. So you don't have to look very hard if you want to find it. It's also in the show notes, of course. In this episode, we talk about the book. Maria tells her life story, shares the best ideas from her book, shares advice for developing taste and becoming a good art collector, uh, not just in a fancy sense, but also in a budget-friendly sense, and a whole lot more. I know you're going to learn a lot from Maria. So I'm going to switch to this conversation now. Maria, welcome to the Lewis and Kyle Show. We're very excited to be chatting today. Hello, Lewis and Kyle. Thank you for having me here. I'm super pumped, and thank you for the invitation. And everybody who's listening, hello. Hope you're well. I hope the audience is doing well as well. We don't say that often enough. That's a good point. I want to start out just right on topic. You have a book coming out very soon. I think we're publishing this. We're, we're going to schedule it to be right in line with that. So it's called How Creativity Rules the World, The Art and Business of Turning Your Ideas into Gold. Do you mind sharing kind of We'll dive into a lot of questions about the book, but my first one is what is the change in people's lives when they read it you hope to occur? Well, this is a very important project for me because I have been a business owner for 13 years after quitting a miserable career as a corporate attorney. And it was important to me to emphasize and give people a blueprint that they can follow so that they can materialize their ideas and it just not stay as an idea. In other words, we all need ideas for progress and that's really what has gotten us here is the reason why we have podcasts is the reason why technology has evolved is because people had an idea that started somewhere right and then step two is creativity which is the application of that idea to solve a problem to improve something that already exists because like there is very little that we can actually invent it's more about how we tweak improve innovate and innovate just means make new right and I think that a lot of uh, ideas do not come to happen because people either do not know how to materialize those ideas or they don't have confidence that they can take them places. And particularly, you know, I am passionate about the idea of entrepreneurship because I was not an entrepreneur when I graduated from Harvard Law and I went to the law firms and I decided to be one by sheer will and desire. So I had to learn how to run my business, come up with ideas, penetrate a completely different industry because I work in the art market and build an industry leader company from scratch. So I think I know a thing or two that I can provide to people on how to do the same. So this is not a book that's going to give you a how to, you know, um, innovate in the space of social media. It's not, it's not that type of thing. I think this is more a book that you are going to keep coming back to as a reference book to find ways to get unstuck, to find ways to bring ideas and inspiration at a moment's notice because everything is highly actionable. And at the end of each chapter, I provide a series of exercises and prompts that allow you to think through what you've learned. It's not a recap. I don't really like recaps. I like more like 
here's your action steps, here's what you have to do. And the beauty of this is like it really works because I have taught a variation of the book in companies and uh, also I launched a program online where I teach people how to do these things for themselves and most of the people who actually do the exercises get enormous breakthroughs. They find the ideas or they find the confidence to differentiate themselves because that's the thing about creativity is how do you stand out from the competitors? What is it that you do that is so unique to you that you build loyal fans, a loyal audience, you know, customers who keep coming back and how do you keep that engine going because that's the other thing right a lot of people rely on their first success and milk it and that's great but there is a point where you can't milk it anymore because people have already gotten everything particularly in a world that moves as fast as the one we're in right now and that means that you have to consistently pivot adjust tweak and pay attention to all the things that are happening, not only in your industry, but also on the intersection of industries. And I think that, for example, the world of crypto is one of those worlds of intersections that for so long they were just explored marginally and nobody was really like taking it seriously and look where it is today, right? And so like crypto, there are many other different segments and industries that are bubbling up right now, but people are not paying attention because they are not the mainstream. And so what I teach in this book is also that the biggest breakthroughs in any career or business do not happen on the mainstream. Otherwise, it'll be too easy, right? And everybody would do that. They happen on intersections, on, on fringes. They happen on connecting dots that nobody else sees and that you actually do see. And, and you go ahead and you connect those dots. Yeah, I, I love that. Um... Maria, I'm an ideas person. I, I have ideas more than I have time in the day to to think about. Lewis uh, will back me up there, and this this podcast is a result of ideas, and I'm I'm all there with you as to the power um, of an idea. Uh, my question is, how do you decide which idea is the one to go after? I, I know in your uh, in, in a podcast I listened to with you, you know, you you talked about following your gut and your intuition um, toward and making a decision. And that part is the hard part for me. And so, um, yeah, I would like to hear you just riff on that a little bit. Well, look, I mean, intuition is super important because intuition is always right. And what's wrong is your human interpretation of the signals that you've gotten. And I think that in order to be able to develop a more intuitive response to things that you have been considering, you really have to be a little bit more um, at peace with the idea that number one, you're going to make some mistakes. And number two, that usually your first response is what it is, right? And if it sounds to you like, oh my goodness, I just made this up, fine. It's okay because it was the first thing that came to mind. But in more practical terms, I suggest that people, when they have a million of ideas, start filtering them through both the system of values, which is what is it that's more important to me? Right. I mean, there are a variety of things that entrepreneurs have on their dashboard of values. One is could be money. One could be uh, freedom. One could be personal fulfillment. One could be helping others, let's say. Right. And so you rank those one, two, three, four. Where do these ideas and like, let's say you have 10 different ideas and you rank them where they fall into those different categories of values. And I think a second one, which is very helpful, is also efficiency and what is the 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 low hanging fruit here right i mean because if for example you rank them all at the same level what is it that you're thinking about that co could be done faster cheaper and without necessarily like healing your resources or putting so much on the table because people want to see wins and we live in, obviously, the, the instant gratification world, right? And so the sooner you see the wins, the more fuel you have. But as you grow older, both as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, you also know that there are things that take longer, that are, that are dreams and 
goals and milestones that will take a long time because of the nature of what you have set out to do, right? And so the, the little uh, ideas that provide faster wins are uh, stepping stones for the bigger one. And it's like when you have a, a big vision, you usually have this kind of, you know, high level big picture in front of you. And then you walk from that final point backwards, right? And so you break down and what are the steps that need to happen? What are the goals? What are the sub goals? Until you get to like, what is it the next thing that I have to do today, right? Like uh, it, it, that could be as simple as sending an email or picking up the phone, you know, because ideas are fantastic, but without action, they are nothing. So that is also one of the main pillars of my book is that if you just sit with your ideas, either someone else is going to do them and you're going to be really pissed when you see somebody else actually executing those ideas, or, you know, you can't really keep giving your energy and thought to something that you're not going to do. So it's, you might as well just relinquish that idea and move on onto something that you can actually materialize. And I think that no matter what you're thinking or dreaming about, there is always a way of materializing somewhat some of those ideas and and obviously they have to be realistic for what you do or, or sometimes they are not realistic i mean the biggest businesses in the world and the most disruptive inventions came from people who really did not believe that there were boundaries right and like when steve jobs started he was not rich he didn't have the funding he did you know zuck was the same and people are going to say but you know i'm not one of them i mean nobody is one of them because each one of us have so much to give and so much particularly because of all the different experiences that we have had growing up and all the different things that we have learned both formally and on the street and the places that we have been and the things that call our attention are really not alike. So I feel wholeheartedly that everybody has incredible incredible things inside of them that they can bring to the world and the only thing that stops them is their own self-doubt self-judgment self-censorship and that type of thing because it's it's you know when you do not move to take a step forward and a piece of action it doesn't really matter how good your ideas are they are just gonna die right there i think you give kyle a lot to think about there i could see him taking a, a good bit of notes uh and I say this often, but I'm glad we record this, right? Because it's it's hard to catch all that at once, and I'm glad people listening can have that same have that same option. I got a spam call. I had a I don't know. I always got to put this in do not disturb. Anyhow, uh, I want to ask you the opposite version of that question. So for the person who doesn't feel creative and doesn't feel like okay, the problem is decision of which ideas to choose, and then the, a discipline to sit down and find next actions. Someone who's just one step before that, and there's like I don't even know what I'm good at. I don't know what my talents are. Like I don't know like the person with, with those kind of like lack of creativity uh, or a perceived lack of creativity. Cause you might say everyone has the potential to be creative, but they haven't found the ability to tap into that yet. Well, I think that first of all, let's never confuse creativity with artistic talent or anything of the like, because they are not the same, right? I mean, if that, somebody can go and paint like Michelangelo, that's one type of talent that very few people have, or perhaps is the culmination of years and years of training from childhood until, you know, you're an adult and whatnot. So creativity is really your unique ability to come up with ideas of value that are relevant for your business or career simple as that right like it's a really really easy concept to understand now creativity it really is a muscle and it's not just one thing it is an amalgamation of skills that people get to make strong and robust by actually working on them every day right and so this the skills or this habits if you will run from the the willingness to take chances whatever it is that you feel is taking a chance for yourself, right? Because for some people is like getting a loan for X amount of dollars and God forbid, you know, you don't really know how you're going to pay that out. And for other people taking a chance is wearing red when they only wear black, right? But like these are little steps that actually build creative thinking. So the ability to, for example, be an autonomous thinker if, and, and an independent thinker is very important for creativity. And so you might be wondering, well, but how do I really do that? I mean, 
I suggest people to balance their stakes in the information that they consume. If you only read what's written on your algorithm, on like whatever is being fed to you because this is what Apple thinks or this is what Facebook thinks, you're already annihilating all the other things in the world, right? And so independent and autonomous thinking comes actually from weighing all the options and not just the ones that have been given to you by society or your school or your parents or your teachers or your friends, right? I mean, and that is actually part of being incredibly creative, like Elon Musk, right? Like everybody said, to, well, why do you have to go into outer space? You already sold PayPal for how many million dollars? And like, he's like, I don't care. I'm really interested in this because I grew up reading science fiction. And I feel that honestly, also the ability to keep asking questions is part of being creative, right? I mean, if you've been giving a task or you've been, or you have been giving a problem and somebody says to you, and this is the way it's done, you have to question that too, right? Or keep asking questions the way that Elon Musk did and say, well, why is it that to send a man, an astronaut to outer space from the United States is so expensive to the extent that we have to ask Russia and pay them to put a man inside of the rockets, right? Be and so what he did is like he spent, I don't know how many months or years asking questions to everybody who had an expertise that he didn't have and how, you know, why is this so incredibly expensive? And the conclusion was that there was really no catch other than the markups that the subcontractors and contractors were charging NASA to build the rockets and the spaceships that were safe and reliable and she said well if this is all they catch I can assemble the team to do that right and that is a really tall incredible order but it's the same thing with anything right it's like why do we utilize just zoom right now for example right or like or why did we not utilize zoom before why did we use all this other rudimentary you know like it's always about asking those questions and keep asking those questions and that is what it is to to creativity is to work on these things daily to the extend that you feel comfortable to a certain degree right because when you take a risk you're not supposed to feel comfortable but that is the point of these things is to keep moving forward in that direction i also believe that People who actually are willing to take five to 10 minutes every day to just be and think without distractions and social media and phones and all the other things come up with extraordinary ideas. And it is some, something that is as simple as building those blocks every day of 10 minutes of silence to just be and to let your brain absorb whatever it is, but in its own way. So you don't have to be consistently on overdrive mode, which is what most people are, right? Like overwhelmed with information, work, uh, you know, every second you have down, you go check the phone and that really strangles creativity. So the tools are very simple. What is hard is for humans to build on the discipline to do these things and to incorporate them in their daily life. Yeah, there's a, a low bar for undistraction, um, and it, it's hard for people to to get to the point where they can take that five ten minutes a day because they're so used to being on their phone. Especially people uh, in Lewis and I's generation, um, you know, twenty or eighteen to twenty four. It's like TikTok is just so enticing. It's like, and what you're doing is you're watching other people's creativity expressed, and it, it's just like, uh, it's sad that you know a lot of that potential is being wasted. Um, but I, I, I hope that, uh, that changes in the future. And I, you know, I love what you said about like, um, about hard things and being uncomfortable and how that leads to creativity. And, you know, one of the things that I was inspired by when researching you was, you know, coming from Venezuela to Harvard law school and just like, you sort of painted the picture of like, you didn't, I mean, you knew English, you got into Harvard law school, but it's like, <laughs> that's, that's like a, a extended period of struggle. And I think that an extended period of struggle is something that really leads to people's creativity. And, you know, that was, that was yours going to Harvard law school from Venezuela and other people's are different, but like it leads to the same place, which is like, um, being able to connect those dots that you're talking about and be e extremely creative or be extremely creative. Um, and so I love that. And then 
I really think, you know, what you're talking about with Elon Musk and asking questions, getting to the bottom of things is, is so important. And part of the reason why Lewis and I started this podcast is because um, of our, our love for questions and belief that questions, you know, are, are like the bedrock of everything. And, um, and I think that's one thing that I've learned from Lewis as well is just getting to the bottom. Um, and then also, I, I just love your points, so I'm going through them, you know, taking the opposite approach with like, consuming media and the algorithms like you're just being fed things and so if you seek out the opposite of what you're being shown that's a really good way i think to to challenge yourself and be in that that state of uncomfortableness uh to learn and and to open up that creative part of your brain um i wanted to ask you know you are so incredible and, and full of ideas and and full of creativity and you, you talk about that nine year period where you were in new york working as a corporate attorney was that just like very suppressive for you? I mean, you, you know, you are so creative. So what was that, that period of time like for you? Well, you know, it's funny because when you said about how uncomfortable it was to go to Harvard, which was, of course, I mean, look, and it's like my, I have an accent right now. Imagine back then, right? I mean, it was like really ridiculously strong. But I knew in a way, you know, Harvard is a very international place and so is Cambridge. So I felt very okay. What was really difficult was actually quitting the law firm and starting something in the art because that was dramatic, right? I had been nine years in that world, like you said, and that was definitely very suppressive because the, you know, the model of the traditional law firm thrives on manuals, how to, this is how you do best practices, which is a word that I freaking hate, you know, it's like best practices means that's been done. And so many times it became a practice and I just really am allergic to that bullshit. I just don't want to hear that, you know? And so when I, um, well, yes, those years were terrible because you first go with emotions. It is what I did. Actually, I, I left, I was able to leave Venezuela because I went to Harvard Law and it was a big thing for me. And obviously I was so young and I was thinking this is the thing I have to do is, you know, safe and prestigious and I will always be okay. And, but I hated it with all my might. And the school is one thing, right? Which is, I mean, Harvard Law is really fantastic. And as you, you meet like wonderful people and the thinkers and whatnot. And then, you know, real life and go into the law firm was really horrific. And I just couldn't take it anymore. First of all, I just did not enjoy that at all. I, it's not that I enjoyed it, but the hours were bad. No, everything was bad. The hours were bad. The, the you know, the, I did not like being an attorney. I, you know, I, I felt my life was slipping through my fingers because I was like doing things that, I was like, just, I can't be tied to this desk and I can't be just doing this shit. I mean, I just can't, right? So, yes, the, the years were very difficult for me and my little scapes were going to galleries and, and museums. I mean, I got married. I mean, like, I wasn't, like, completely, you know, detached from, like, life. I got married and I was pregnant and I had a child. And, you know, so the, the thing is, corporate America... And it has sort of changed a little bit, but corporate America has a specific way of doing things. And that's why, to a certain degree, they can afford to grow that much because it's all codified in specific ways and manuals. And one way or the other, people are a little bit like robots, right? They have to do what they have to do. And which is very paradoxical because the first thing that employers right now are looking for is creative people. But then when you get there, they don't let you be, which is super insane, right? Like if you think about it, they want you to come up with solutions, but the solutions have to be formed within such a small box that you can't, right? I mean, like, and obviously this is not every company, you know, we have incredible tech companies. We have many, many things. I mean, this is a humongous country and there are millions of things happening and the world also is vast and there are great things happening in every country, right? If you think about it, but those years were suppressive. And I think it was kind of like bubbling up inside of me that I wanted to bring it out. Right. And, and I think that because it was bottled up for so long, it came out with such 
a strength, right? Like I was like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be so unique and different and I'm going to conquer every fear that I have and everything that has ha- haunted me, right? And I am, and I literally went from the attorney unknown, anonymous and whatever, right? To like this kind of high profile figure within my industry, like two or three years later, everybody knew who I was because I was working as the art advisor for Puff Daddy. So suddenly... I was on like this limelight of things as people were how this girl went from being an attorney to landing this type of clients, right? And the truth is, it was a combination of being in the right place at the right time and also having my creativity dictate my next steps and being so truthful to who I really was that people couldn't help but notice me. And this is applicable to any business, to any brand, to anything that you want to do. It's just not unique of how I did it, if that makes sense. Yeah, another line that really captures that well that I have like recommended a book to a lot of people that sh- t- shares a lot of similar stories is called So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport, right? And it's a line from the comedian Steve Martin. And, you know, everyone asked him after his decades of like comedy experience how he became famous. And basically all he said was, I just became so good that like it was inevitable to become famous. Like you just have to do the work and be good at your craft. And then that, like that just is, that's the answer. Uh, so I want to ask about a little bit about art now and taste making and things like that. Uh, I've definitely been described as like a minimal, minimalist person with often with rooms with very bare walls. And I tell myself a lot of the reason I like avoid art is cause I'm like, of like the Diderot effect where if you like buy one really nice thing, Right then, you're like everything else starts to look bad. You're like, like, so it's like if I make my bed look nice, all of a sudden I'm gonna have to like make my desk look better. And if I get like nice shirts, I'm gonna need nice pants. Then I'm just gonna run out of money all of a sudden in this consumption spiral. Uh, So I guess my question to you is like, one, how do you help someone who has, for the most part, kind of been like someone with? I'm sure you come with a lot of people who might have a lot of money, but they don't have like a history of expressing themselves in terms of decoration and kind of Mm -hmm. externalizing their personality to like the area around them. So how do you like help someone to decide what their taste is? then also like avoid the consumption spiral. Those are two separate questions. Yes. Um, well, I, I like the Diderot effect. It's like also James Clear wrote about it in Atomic Habits, right? And like <laughs> so when you give them a little bit of money and they go crazy, right? But for the most part, I think that, okay, the the taste making is, is kind of like, a, it, it's a complicated part because you want to respect the client's previous ideas of what they liked but at the same time you want to steer them in the right direction so a lot of people have one way or another spent some money on something to hang on their walls right whether it is you know a piece of crap or you know a slightly in between something good and something bad but for the most part it's not necessarily good, right? And so you don't want to offend them. I don't want to, necessarily, you know, it's like, that's not how you actually catch clients by offending them, right? So I just, what I do is that I get to understand that there is usually ways that people gravitate. Like either they are always attracted to similar colors or they are attracted to figures or they are attracted to abstract, right? I mean, it's like, that's kind of like, is is very easy is is one of those three things right and people tend to move towards the same thing time and again it's like usually has to do also with the way they the the clothes they wear the spaces they have and how you know what is their aesthetic so uh, it's my job to understand that because it's not me imposing onto them what I like but within that space of what they've told me they like or the things that I see that they have acquired in the past and how they live or what are the things that resonate in their aesthetic, I can actually recommend what I think is the best thing in that space, right? And so it's it's a process of co-creation of this new taste. And usually when people, like you just said, like they have something that is much better than what they used to have before and then all the things don't you know they don't have the same appeal right so the Diderot effect is interesting because I have not gotten that in the art uh, like the job that I do because people usually they know their limits and they also as they grow with their businesses or careers they make more money so it's like one thing 
brings the other and as time goes by right two things could happen they might not need me anymore or they might need me more because they decided that they want to have such a vast art collection that they are going to store you know half of it or more and then they are going to rotate it every year or they just want to upgrade things and sold the first ones that they bought and things like that so it is i think collecting art is a very it's a passion it is a it's a it's a lifelong endeavor where people grow with their collection it has a lot of emotional meaning i feel that people are as attached to the art as they are to their houses or more because they might be happy to sell a house for profit and then kind of like go into the next house but they don't feel that they want to part ways with art that they have collected in their lives especially when they supported a young artist who became famous and started having museum shows and things like that which is oftentimes what i am known for is spotting this young and new talents and recommending them to my clients before they actually have their huge you know break in the art world and things like that so I don't uh, I mean I, I I understand that that could happen that the the raw effect but usually people who have amassed a lot of money don't necessarily want to waste it you know they have they know i mean unless you win the lottery right like i mean which is really the typical data raw effect is that oh my goodness what am i going to do with this you know 10 million bucks and then you know next thing you know they like you know went to vegas and to you know seven trips around the world and bought i don't know what and a car and you know wasted it all so it's it's actually a very interesting question and thank you for asking it because i had not thought about that ever before well, maybe the reason I asked it is because I am in Las Vegas right now, so that, that could be <laughs> that could be that could be part of it. Uh, you know, I think that the Diderot effect sort of comes from a place of like anxiety, Lewis. Like, you know, you're like, I don't want to do this because it's going to lead to that because I know myself. But it's like you can always just buy one thing. Um, it's a very intellectualized <laughs> excuse for sure. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Maria, I so I watched this movie one time about. Um, somebody who was writing i think it was the webster dictionary he he was like a professor at oxford and he was tasked with like a 20-year uh project of, of of um making a dictionary and he got mm -hmm. stuck on the word art for like a full year and a half um so i wanted to ask you to w define art um just as the word and then i when i think about it i'm like art is a feeling but it's like that can't be right uh, so, so what do you think about uh, the definition of art? I think art is the materialization of an idea. And um, this is where we go back to what I was saying before about action, right? That if it is just in my head and I'm, so, I'm this poet and it's all in my head and I never write the poetry and I never put it out there, it's just not art because it's just in my head, right? And I think the concept of art can be extremely inclusive in the sense that it's not just circumscribed to what it is hanging on the walls or what it is. You know, I think that a room that has been designed, you know, amazingly well is art. A woman who wears clothes in a very flamboyant and interesting way is art. And so I think that the the tricky part is whatever it is, your aesthetic, right? Because what is great for me is not great for Kyle or Lewis because it's a different type of aesthetic. It could be, right? And so, you know, I, I think that the concept of art should be embraced as this materialization of an idea that resonates with the individual who receives it, right? Because it's all about, you know, art is always a two-way street. It is the artist had an intention, the artist, writer, filmmaker, woman with the dress, whatever, had an intention, right? And the person who receives it has a also has an intention right i mean the intention could be to be enlightened to learn something to be inspired to open up their minds to different angles and points of view so it is all a two-way street and that is actually very important i think that people also who are not in the business of making art should consider themselves as co-creator of this whole thing because it depends on them as much as it depends on whomever created something right 
Kyle's task between now and when we publish this is finding w- that movie so he can put it in the show notes. I, no- I would love to know that. No, I was wondering. I know what it is. Um, uh, okay. Uh, well, now I forget it. But it's something and the madman <laughs> because the story is that this professor, um, and this is a sidetrack, but I'll go into it. He, um, he sent out a, a letter to everyone in England to help um, like mass or, or decentralize the process of finding the definitions of all of these words. Because they were going back like with the etymology of these words into the 1200s. Um, and the, the person who wrote back and was the most prolific in that process was somebody in a mental, in- mental institution um, who was very well read. He was a doctor. And so he went through the entire, um, like he sent more words than anyone else. And I think that he might've been the one that actually ended up finding or, or writing the best definition of art. Uh, but the movie is more about um, the, the madman and his descent and, and the friendship that um, kind of grows between the professor in Oxford and this um, like madman. So I'll find Love the it. name right now and then uh, I'll let you, uh, let you know. Yes. But Lewis, go ahead and. Yes. So I have a question. We also on this podcast pretty often, and this probably won't come as a surprise to you given, like I said, I, I work in the crypto industry. We discuss art very often, or sorry, we discuss investing very often. Uh, we don't discuss art that often. Uh, we should maybe, but we, uh, one question I wanted to ask you about was masterworks. If you're familiar with that concept and what you think, if that has a positive effect on the art industry, kind of for people who aren't familiar with masterworks, it's essentially like index ones for artwork, sort of, you can buy fractionalized pieces of major paintings. Uh, so, you know, you can't afford a whole piece by Banksy, but you can afford $20 worth of a million dollar piece. Then you just get, if the whole thing becomes 1.5 million, then your $20 appreciates by 50%. Uh, but people are buying this without ever actually being able to own the art, display the art. So how do you think this kind of, do you think this is a good thing for the art industry? Do you think it's just a capitalist endeavor? That's like, wh- what are your thoughts on like this trend of over financializing, fractionalizing physical artwork? I actually know the team at Masterwork because they have contacted me in the past for acquisitions and I, well, you know, here's the thing. I think the idea is fantastic and I think that it is such a wonderful way of like being creative with investment in art. I'm not necessarily sure that from my point of view, having a fractionalized share of an artwork brings anything meaningful to anybody's life, right? I mean, I think at the end of the day, the concept of living with art or or owning it, even if it's for investment, right? It it has both um, an idea of ownership, right? And that's why NFTs are so popular because it is an ownership of something and also bragging rights over something you own and uh, that makes you proud to have. Rather than saying I have the certificate that grants me a quarter of a piece of, you know, Andy Warhol or Banksy or whatever you want to call. I think that for from a business standpoint, I find it fascinating from a long term, you know, viability for people who have a bug inside of them that is just not having a piece of paper that or you know an email for that matter that says you own this it doesn't really do it for me i think it's um that's that's how i look at it and um you know i don't know if really after all the fees that are in the fine you know lines and like then the, and the fine read of the prospectus after charging all the fees and doing all that like people are actually going to see the return that they will expect but it might as well be because the art market is very crazy. As you know, markets are irrational no matter what markets are, right? Like once there is a market, it's really irrational. And so things have tripled, quadrupled, you know, and, and gotten uh, an increase 10 times, 100 times, right? For no reason. And Masterworks does a really excellent job of going not only after that type of artist, but they also go after the best type of works from that artist so in that sense they do have a very excellent team on research and acquisitions and uh, they go see things in person I know for a fact because as I'm telling you I've worked with them and so they they are legit they are legit for sure they are legit it's just that the ownership model for me it's just it doesn't do it but again like there are many ways 
you know, to do things and, and to own things. And, and, and I go back to like what I just said about the NFTs and that usually is a lot more kind of like it's revolutionary in a way. And it's also, um, it's, it's also kind of like harder to grasp sometimes for people of older generations, right? Because it's like you own a code of letters and numbers that are written on the blockchain and then you have a JPEG that anybody can just like download and put like us, you know, your like your screensaver right on your computer or whatever it is, right? But it's like the idea of having digital ownership over an asset that is only yours. And maybe it was just like, you know, it was a hundred bucks turned like, you know, um, as a conversion from Ethereum or whatever, but it is yours, right? And then you have a bunch of them displayed on a website. And, and, and so there are different ways to think about this, but if I can encourage people to actually think about investing in art, starting with an emerging artist and figuring out ways like to fall, if that is your passion, right? Like it's also, if you're investing on a million things already, or you have, you know, crypto and portfolios, then if, if you're not passionate about art, it might just be really drudgery and a waste of your time. And you don't want to do that. Right. But if you really feel it's interesting and I, I can't imagine that anybody's going to think it's not interesting because artists are worlds unto themselves and they have so much to give to anybody who want to get into the wavelength of learning why they do things and what is the ultimate objective and, you know, all the little secrets behind the artwork that they make. I think that it could be great if people want to start just buying from emerging artists and going to the super young art fairs or looking onto the websites that sell art that is an interesting thing much more interesting to me than to say i have you know this this little part of this artwork and when they sell i cash out i don't know yeah i mean it's it's like you said before with um you know art is two-sided like the person that sees the woman wearing the dress has to see her and receive that in the same way like um if you don't uh, you know enjoy buying fractional pieces it's like that's just an investment you know they're just trying to, to make a little bit of money but um I, I think it's an interesting and, and innovative model uh it's just not for everybody for sure i'm not an investor or anything i just um i, I think it's interesting um so <clears throat> when you are working with a client and and helping them to you know figure out what art works for them and, and and how it sort of plays into their own uh individual self like how do you weigh that uh investment versus aesthetic um like paradigm or or like prism for an artist like you know people are coming to you because you've got this incredible skill for finding artists very early and they know that that probably means they're going to make some money but it, it's how do you how do you weigh those two things I usually give my clients kind of warnings right beforehand. And I said, well, look, this is something that came to me and I thought this could be perfect for you. Here's the deal. I'm not sure where it's going to go, but it's only, let's say, $10,000, right? I mean, I'm just like, it's a ballpark number that is not really outrageous for some of the people that I work with, right? And they, um, you know, they, they might consider that as, let's say, my Wall Street clients or hedge fund clients think about those things like us, you know, frontier market mm -hmm. stock, right? Like, I mean, you is like a gamble, but you're not really putting all your eggs on that. And you're not putting it's like, oh, well, it's like fun to have it in my no go no anywhere. And then when there is a little bit more of a desire to have both the aesthetic and the investment in then it's like a whole different conversation, right? It's like, look, this is a little bit more perhaps expensive, not that much, but here's what I know about this artist that hasn't been publicly released yet. It's, you know, it's in conversations with this important gallery to offer this person a solo show, or I know this huge art collector who has a foundation has been acquiring silently and things like that, right? I mean, it's like the intel behind the scene mm -hmm. that 
before it hits all the news or is in all the trade magazines or whatever I have been doing because this is really what I do for a living, right? And, and you know, it, like the beauty of this is that it's not insider trading. I mean, I'm not trading with stock, right? It's just like information that you gather and you see things and then you make an evaluation of the static mare. I mean, there are so many things to be actually be taken into account because, you know, the artist's education matter, but a lot of artists are self-taught and they never had the money actually to go because that's one of the reasons why a lot of artists don't go to art school is because they really don't have the capabilities of getting those type of loans to pay for that type of education in the United States. That is absurdly expensive, right? And so an MFA and, you know, the BFA and things like that. And whereas other artists can go and, you know, finish an MFA at Yale, which is one of the best ones in the world, really. And that may or may not guarantee that the artist is going to do well, right? Because it all has to do also with marketing skills. It has to do with, you know, if you appeal to the certain group of people who are looking for a certain thing, like right now, you know, there is this whole renaissance of black artists. They have always existed, but for some reason, people in galleries didn't notice them until like five years or 10 years ago, which is a terrible shame. But but now, because it is, they continue to be minorities, there is scarcity and people want them, you know. And so, I mean, is it going to be the same in the next 10 years? Maybe, but there might be other things, right? Like, I mean, non-binary artists. And so it's it's kind of like, it's not that it's the trend of the moment, but it's also what has not been commonly found and seen usually is very appealing to people because it is unique and is intriguing and is different. And I also believe that, you know, what is part of my mission to open up the minds of these collectors to new things and to have those points of view incorporated in their lives, right? I mean, and and, and you want to make sure that you're pushing that, you know, you're pushing for that like slowly and elegantly and with kindness because I don't consider to just have a collection of contemporary art to just be decorative. I mean, contemporary art is a, a way for us to process the now, you know, and understand our place in history and remember that for the past 600 years, really, since the Renaissance, we have we know how people look because of these paintings, right? Like now we have photos and videos and things like that, but we didn't, we wouldn't have known how any of those people looked and how the world looked according to these painters had it not been because they did it. I mean, there is a whole other side of history and then the arts that is not necessarily the most mainstream, if you will, like Asian and African art, but we do have figurines and things from those cultures as well that teach us what happened at any given time. So I don't see the world of art slowing down or at nothing because NFTs are here and that's wonderful, but it doesn't mean that people are not going to collect art to put on their walls because, you know, 3,000 years ago on the walls of, you know, the ruins in Ephesus in Turkey, there are frescoes that people wanted to live with, right? And, and by the same token, throughout history, you've seen that people want to have things on their walls to live with. Now it's, I guess, with a different purpose because... It's not just the painting, but it's like the idea and it's having that piece of culture inform your life all the time, right? And so I I want to make sure that my clients have that. I think this will be our last question out of respect for everybody's time this morning. What is your favorite piece of art you've collected just this year or that you've been involved with just in 2022 so far? Not of your whole career because that might be a different question. Just recent memory, kind of the coolest piece you've been involved with recently. Huh. Well, I, um, let me think. That is a very difficult question, actually. It is quite difficult. <sighs> I have, try to narrow I have, the scope to uh, make it easier. Two quick questions <laughs> afterward, too. I, I know Lewis said the last one, but I've got, I got two more. All right, then it was my last one. Okay, yes. Uh, there is an artist from Peru. Um, she's, well, th they are non-binary and, uh, the name is Winnie Minerva and what Winnie does is this combination of abstract and uh, figuration and it's about the human body in different places and times and also not being 
constrained by society and a little bit of pleasure and pain. I know it sounds so abstract, but just like look look it up, Winnie Minerva. And um, her gallery has been trying to figure out how to make her, them move to New York because they have an amazing training in uh, classic art, but they have done a lot of residencies in New York and around the States, and now it's time. So it's exciting because it's, um, I, I think it has a lot of uh, upside, and right now it's quite inexpensive. So I found that to be super exciting. Love that. Um, we'll so check it out. You mentioned NFTs a few times. Lewis and I are, are very into crypto. I've had a lot of podcasts about crypto. Um, I wanted to, so, so the, the key innovation that I see with um, NFTs, well, not the key, but just one of them is this idea of immutable provenance, <laughs> provenance that goes forward into time and cannot change. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask about provenance as it relates to the value of art in your world and also um, what you think about like in the future, how we will look at this history of ownership uh, and it be exactly right. And whether or not I think that's interesting. Well, I think provenance is very interesting for a variety of reasons. One is because it allows traceability and to see, you know, something that is legit. Like the provenance of something that goes, let's say, 300 years back, it has to be verified so many times, right? And this happens all the time when museums acquire things. And for example, when this whole thing of uh, Salvatore Mundi happened, right? I mean, it's like continues to be like the most expensive thing that has ever sold at auction, you know, for $500 million. And like the provenance really couldn't be fully built to the back, right? Like and, and established because this was something that we still don't know if it was fabricated, if it was really made by Da Vinci and things like that, right? But um, more recent provenance, let's say, I mean, I think it's fascinating when you go to a museum because this is the only place where you can really see these things is when you read the labels or you go onto the website and they say, well, this was owned by, you know, the king of Spain and this and that. And like, it goes back to all these amazing people, right? But the truth of the matter is that, you know, it might be important at that level, but at the normal level, when there is a secondary market transaction, you just have to make sure that it was owned by someone who bought it from the gallery, and that's very easy sometimes to find. What is not easy to find is once a thing has been going from one hand to the other, and that is what NFTs bring to the table, is that every time you want to actually you know, make a transaction with that and, and sell it and resell it, we're going to see who's the owner each time, right? I mean, or we're going to see where that thing is. And I think that the concept of having a registry on a ledger that is the blockchain is going to be applicable to tangible goods as well, because the problem of the art market is that you don't know where things end, right? And so you don't know who's the owner of something. And for example, if a, an artist once is like has gotten to a point where they are going to have a retrospective at a big museum and they want to incorporate certain artworks, it might be that when they were young, they sold it to somebody and that somebody has disappeared and they don't know where to find that thing anymore. Or also you want to use it for, for purposes of making sure that it is legit, right? Like a lot of things can be easily, you know, made like counterfeit. Like you can fake a Banksy, let's say, right? Like so you it's like you want to bring it back without having to be calling Banksy or emailing him like the studio and not getting an answer. Usually with an NFT, you're going to be able to see that. The things that are easily, uh, you know, copied and things that can be knocked off easily are going to be protected with nfts but more importantly i think is also for those artists who are programming royalties so every time they sell you get something out of that because in in how it is right now in the u.s is that they don't get any i mean the the royalties are not going to be once you sell something at auction at a big auction house the the artist gets no benefit right it got the original benefit but then when they when that was sold the first time but then in in subsequent times there's not going to be any residual royalty for that person but with the nfts that is happening in the secondary market every time something is sold then the artist gets something out of that and that actually i find it fascinating and it's a complete leap on copyrights on you know how intellectual property and how 
people actually are going to be compensated for their own ideas and their creations. And so I think that all this is here to stay. I think that the evolution of digital art, we're going to have to start paying attention of how people are going to utilize these things. Because again, you're not going to live with them on the walls the same way you live with a painting, but it may have, maybe they are going to be on a, on a screen rotating on the walls of people or maybe they're going to be projected and so this these advancements are super important for not only for the art world for also for society and for younger generations that are so used to doing things in a, in a way that is mostly digital well maria we are really grateful for your time today and and i think that was a really incredible podcast and you're an incredible person so thank you very much um if our audience was listening to this and they want to learn more about you or, or find your book where should we send them well uh, the book is called how creativity rules the world and it is available whatever books are sold amazon Barnes and noble indiebound uh bookshop.org, all your independent bookstores, call them up if you want to support them. And my website is mariabrito.com. That's B-R-I-T as in Tom O.com. And you find links to all my social media there. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And that wraps up this episode with Maria Brito. One more time, her book, how Creativity Rules the World. I got it right here. You can get your copy on Amazon or literally wherever you buy books. Should be really easy. She did all the things right. So you'll find it if you want to. Three takeaways from me. Uh, first one is about buying from emerging artists. I really like that a lot. Kyle and I on this podcast try to find interesting people kind of at the beginning of their career. Or they've done a ton of interesting things already, but we know you know, the things they're going to do in the next five to 10 years are going to be five to 10x more interesting and impactful than what they're doing and talking about today. And you can kind of have a similar impact on an emerging artist when you're one of their first supporters. And then all this, you know, you always see like the financial opportunity of betting on the upside of the artwork, just an interesting way to do that. And of course, that's a way to have pieces no one else has because the artists are emerging and you were hashtag early. Um, next takeaway from me is I was really overthinking, you know, developing taste and de developing an art collection. Basically, she said, it, it's kind of about what resonates with you, what vibes with your intuition. And the only way to know that is to, you know, just start looking at art, start in art in a very loose sense. It could be at like a community show. It could be on eBay, whatever, and just buy pieces and put them on your wall. And it's going to resonate or it's going to not. And people are going to give you positive feedback or they're going to not. And there's not a whole lot more to it. You don't need to get too scientific about it. You don't need to be worried about falling into a consumption spiral. Just kind of get in and get going and don't make these kind of fancy excuses and stories about why you can't because there's inexpensive art and you can get started probably on any budget. Third takeaway is this one's going to be a little funky, but really zoning in on the phrase artists are world into themselves. That resonated with me as an interesting expression. I've heard it you know, over and over again, you know, that person's a world into themselves, but kind of in the way Marie explained it with the amount of creativity and like what just defines a universe, right? There's kind of like unique rules. There's unique characters. There's like unique things that are happening, just like its own, own ecosystem. And the idea of like an individual mind being so special that it is a world into itself is something I've not really thought about the meaning of the expression before, but we see that a lot, right? With people like a single individual creates the Marvel universe or a cure the dawn creates his own inner subjective, uh, kind of inner self-referential musical ecosystem that's become a universe up until itself, uh, unto itself. And hearing, hearing the way she described it about artists kind of made that expression really click for me. And uh, so I think that's a really high compliment you can pay someone, just saying like they're so deep, they're a universe until themselves. And it's, it's a random thing to focus on, but I'm pointing it out as an interesting expression and it's a high compliment to hear it. So if someone ever tells you that, congrats. That's all I have to say for this episode with Maria Brito. I thought it was a great episode. Hope you feel the same way about it. If you want more Lewis and Kyle, because you enjoy us and what we're doing, which we hope you do, make sure that you are followed, subscribed, doing whatever that relevant action step is on whatever platform you're listening to this current episode. That'll be the best way to find out about the next episode as soon as it comes out. Otherwise, you can have a conversation with us. We're pretty easy to find on social media. Not even going to tell you how. At this point, you can figure it out for yourself if you want to say hi. But I'd encourage you to do so if you'd like to ask questions, contribute to the show in any way, suggest guests, any of that stuff. We'd love for you to do it. Otherwise, we'll be back soon. See you then. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.